Okay, <clears throat> so we'll have our question and answer session. And uh, before we do that, let's just uh, take a minute, reconnect, uh, go within. Okay, so uh, thank you for the questions. Um, it's, it's always really useful to have questions just so I can see what interests you or what is uh, problematic or intriguing. So I appreciate it, thank you so much. Um, the first question was really straightforward and it's a good question, which is basically what's the first line of the text? Um, which is Emma Ho. What does that mean, Emma Ho? And you'll see this Emma Ho in many uh, texts of this type. And it's basically how wondrous. <laughs> it basically means how wonderful it is, the things that are about to be spoken. And uh, so it's an exclamation of, yay, emptiness and dependent arising are awesome topics to get to talk about. Hooray! So that, that answers that one. Um, so Emma Ho is um, something that will keep coming up. Sometimes it's um, recited in prayers. If you ever go to a group guru puja practice, there's a part where you make an offering prayer to the teacher and it starts out Emma Ho very slowly and somberly and respectfully, but it still just basically means yay. <laughs> so anyway. Um, the next question was, I think about verse, or uh, yeah, verse number three, about what does it mean is and is not. So is and is not, I'll pull up that verse so you can look at it. <clears throat> Let me just find it here. Okay, yeah, it's verse three if you're wanting to look yourself. And um, referring to the mother. It says, she is perhaps that is and is not quietly spoken by my brother dependent arising. This diverse subject object world is my mother's gentle smile, this cycle of birth and death, her deceptive words. So is, is only is <laughs> in dependence upon something being not. And something being not is in dependence upon something being is. So both the concept of affirmation and the concept of negation are dependent arising, right? They're, neither of them exist kind of in and of themselves all by themselves, right? So to say she is perhaps is and is not quietly spoken by my brother dependent arising is to say that things are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. For example, things being yes or no, things existing or not existing, all existing within a context. So that's the short answer to that one, but it's, it's worth sitting with the poetry of it and kind of to see what it evokes because these words are not by accident, even though they're concepts very familiar to us by now. So if you kind of hit them from the angle that they're said, I think it can be quite meaningful and maybe flare a new experience in your mind. Um, let's see, the next one was related to verse seven. Um, let's see 
And verse seven is a really pithy one. Not finding my father when sought is in fact finding my mother. My father is found in my mother's lap. That's how these kind parents save their child, I'm told. So the question was, what does that mean? How these kind parents save their child? And it's, it's again this playing with this idea that us, the lunatic child, have within us the parents themselves. Yeah, we are born from the mother, we are born from emptiness, but we are also empty of inherent existence ourselves and things are in a sense born from us. The father is that which is sought, the object, and we are the one that is creating or focusing in on something to be sought. So they are both together outside in a sense, but they're also both inside, inside in a sense more significantly. And the way in which that saves their child is to realize two things. The first is that what we always talk about in Buddhism, that you already have everything you need for transformation. Yeah, everything you need for transformation is within your reach because your mind has Buddha nature. Your mind is clarity and awareness. The stains are adventitious and additional, right? So that very fact means that you can save yourself and you are your own parents in this sense. You are your own support team. The other sense is talking about realizing emptiness is what will stop suffering. So realizing the nature of subject and object, of realizing the nature of father and mother, these are the things that will help us cut the root of suffering. So if we wanna look at what His Holiness says, um, once again, he says, you know, my father is an analogy for the object which we investigate, the basis on which emptiness is established. My father in my mother's lap means that all these diverse things, pure and impure objects, are manifestations of emptiness. And therefore, all actions, agents, and so forth are also manifestations of this emptiness, which stays here in my mother's lap. So an object and what it's empty of can't be separated. Right? The object and its emptiness can't be pulled apart. They're always together. And most significantly, they're together within us. So we save ourselves through recognizing that. Oh, I can't hear you, Rana. Uh, unmute. So. Can you give an example of what does it mean, pure object? What does it mean, impure object? We all know. Oh, what impure, mean, contaminated by karma and impure. What does it mean, pure object? Sorry? What does it mean, pure object? Something not contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions. Can you elaborate about it? Well, like so what many kind, things in Buddhism. Of, what kind of an appearance it is? What kind of what is it? What kind of an event, of a mental event it is? Event? Yeah. Um, or condition or. Well, I refer, okay. I refer to, the, to the word object. Yeah, but for it to be an object, it has to be an object of mind in this context. So what makes things pure and impure is the mind observing them. Yeah, so even though it sounds like it's the object's fault or the object's quality, what we're really talking about is the mind observing it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of this kind of framework in these texts, right, where it sounds like we're talking about attributes of what we're looking at, 
but we're framing it in that way in order to kind of do some mental gymnastics to help kind of warm up our mind to see that we're the ones that made it look that way. We're the ones that made it look that way. And in recognizing that we fix it. So rather than fixing the outside, a turning, transforming the inside then transforms the outside. So would it be correct to say, to say that a pure object is something that I, with my mind, see its emptiness, its un inherent existence? Yeah, yeah, I think you can say that. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, you know, this, uh, this text is got a lot of layers and, um, and I think that it's one that would be really lovely to keep coming back to. And as I mentioned yesterday, um, it's going to be taught at Toshida um, in July, also in August by um, a young Rinpoche as well as Geshima is going to do the tutorials. So it's really an amazing opportunity. I'm going to try and go to as many as I can. But if you're wanting any follow up on this text, uh, see the Toshida website. So the other question was, when things are hurting you, how can you manage without repression or superficially? And, you know, this is the question of how to understand Buddhism in a way that doesn't fall into spiritual bypassing, which is, you know, when you know what you're supposed to think about something in a transformative way, you pretend that's how you already think about it, even though you're not there yet. So that's one danger. The other danger is kind of a gaslighting. I don't know if you use this word in Hebrew, where you're kind of just lying to yourself with excessive positive thinking, you know? So it's like uh, we say having rose colored glasses and you're not really doing the deep work of feeling your feelings, of knowing that there is pain, knowing that there is difficulty. You know that you're supposed to transform these things, so you act as if you've already transformed them before the work has been done. So this is a mistake um, in our understanding of Buddhism, you know, and it's a mistake that a lot of people fall into, because in Buddhism, these Lojong tradition teachings, these thought transformation teachings, are pointing us to the highest aspirational way of viewing the world not saying here's how you should already think magically without any effort it's an invitation to explore a different way of looking at life it's a radical reframing so you you do this work by a conscious assessment with memory and with logic where you genuinely sit with your past problems that are somewhat resolved or all the way resolved, if there is such a thing, and you remember how much you needed them <clears throat> for the work that you do now. You know, if not for this or that difficult parent dynamic, you wouldn't have the same pathways of empathy for this or that patient, for example. You know, without this or that hardship, you wouldn't have the patience and resiliency that you so value about yourself today. And it's, a very deep gratitude. It's not a superficial gratitude. And that deep gratitude of how fortunate I am to have experienced hardship means that the next time you meet hardship, there's a little bit more spaciousness in your mind to cope with the pain of it, to sit in the middle of the pain of it, and to not be afraid of it. So you're not forcing yourself to transformation before you're ready. And you're also not pretending you've already transformed. Yeah, so all of these teachings are really to show you that genuinely we've needed hardship. And if we view it with a type of gratitude and an understanding of interdependence of karma, et cetera, really our life is gonna be rich and meaningful and full of amazing things. It's, it's delicate, yeah, it's very delicate, but 
it's a different thing than also saying the story of my pain is a true story. Yeah, the fact of your pain is a fact, you're having pain, but what you're saying is the reason for your pain and the conclusion you make from your pain, these are things that are actually subjective and worth examining because they don't have to mean what you've decided they mean, which is basic psychology as well, right? Never mind Buddhism, it's just basic psychology. You can reframe, right? You can think about it differently. But it's not like surface CBT. Do you understand how it goes more deeply than that? Yeah. So the invitation is to use the past to create space in the present so that you're not pushing away pain, but you're not also indulging the story of your pain and identifying with it. You're able to live in the center of it and let it roll through like a wave and not miss the meaning and the learnings along the way. Because you're no longer afraid or assuming that it will be this way forever. And you know there's good to come out the other end of it. The words can sound really cliche. You have to really sit with the deepest sense of it. Yeah, uh, Ronan, did you want to add to that one? No, 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 no. I think it's a, it's a very good uh, foundation to sit it over. But I would like to invite people from the to add some other questions that you have. Anybody wants to ask, please come to the, this mic that uh, you can hear and see you. I'm listening, I'm just grabbing headphones. Hi, oh, yeah. Hi, Nathan. How are you? Hey, good. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's an opportunity to say hello officially and to say it's a pleasure to follow your teachings and your meditation. It's really a pleasure. And I wanted to ask for some more guidance with respect to the meditation that you gave. When we did the four points, you scan the body, then the breath, then the thoughts then the clarity and spaciousness of the mind. And with the last one, I was a bit stuck. Because I understand the analogy, we focus on the sky, not on the clouds. In the analogy aspect, I understand, but then I was trying to relate to my experience and I didn't know what to, what to find because everything we experience is through mental factors. So how do you feel? Can you feel or you just analyze and use analogies to understand the spaciousness and clarity of the mind? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think it's one that we, we really have to play with because it's, it's a big step to even be able to notice the thoughts, isn't it? <laughs> you know, to even be able to have enough kind of mental space to see the movement without falling in. And even just getting there is like fantastic. And if that's all we ever did, it would be fantastic. The next step of that is, it's not like you can be without engagement in your mental factors, as you know, but it's that you're sort of de-emphasizing the most moving ones, the most articulate ones, you know, the mental factor of discrimination and the mental factor of feeling. You're kind of like de-emphasizing your awareness of them. Even though they keep operating, they're omnipresent mental factors, they have no choice. You're, you're just kind of like, turning down the volume or shifting your gaze in a sense to more just like attention yeah or mental engagement just kind of being with one mental factor in a more kind of reflective way that is in a way trying to hold the generality of things 
as if you were watching the reflections of clouds, not just watching the clouds, you know? And then what is it that's able to reflect clouds? And you're kind of, you know, making poetic pictures in your mind and painting watercolors and getting distracted. But then, you know, it's like, stop painting. And just what is it that can hold the paintbrush or what is it that can hold the light and just kind of rest in non-reactivity. So when Young Zerimshe teaches this, he really emphasizes that phrase, non-reactive. So it's not just your bare awareness watching the thoughts, trying to be non-reactive like normally. It's almost as if you're pulling further back just into an ambiance of non-reactivity. Yeah, so it's, it's just like, don't add anything, <laughs> you know? And if you don't add anything, the mental factors quiet, but don't go silent, but they quiet. And there's a subtler sense of the mental experience behind or under or above, however you feel it, that's other than mental factors and movement. So it's not like you're you know, ever without the clouds, it's just that you have an awareness that there is something other than that also, which is just much more reflective. So whenever you feel yourself kind of intrigued by the drama of the weather, you just kind of release, you know, not pushing, not chasing, just kind of release back into holding. I, I think it's, in, in a way it's easier when you're not meditating to touch that space. Like I was thinking the other day about when you're riding a horse that is a really well-trained horse, you can start to let go of the focus of needing to guide them. But if you let go of the focus completely, they'll still go off the trail and eat grass. So it's like, they don't need you like on the reins, like telling them what to do every second, but you also can't completely fall asleep. You know, so you're like very relaxed, focused, spacious. But in those moments, you know, once you're like in flow state, there's not a lot of words or explanations to yourself. You're just kind of in reflectiveness. And the other mental factors are a much more gentle experience. So maybe it's a bit like that. Or, you know, old person on a rocking chair on a porch looking at the mailman, kind of a hmm. <laughs> spaciousness yeah I can add something from the psychological point of view um, I want to add to this something that from the psychological point of view uh, then in the same vein that you are answered uh, earlier concerning the uh, clarity of object or impurity of object is something which doesn't relate to the characteristic of the object but uh, to the process of the mind. So, to the question of the air, I think you could add such a, a component that it's not what I'm going to observe and not react, but it's something that uh, has to be related to the state of dissolving of the mind. As if it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't relate to content, it doesn't relate to processing, it even doesn't relate to itself. In time, it's a kind of, uh, of uh, a total dissolving from something which can observe. It becomes from an observer to the infinite uh, luminosity. Yeah, I mean, you know, this word dissolving is tricky for me. Um, I know that you use it in psychoanalysis, maybe, or you use it just because you like the word. Um, and it's a beautiful word, and it conveys some meaning. The worry I have with the word dissolve is that it connotes to me some little sense of dissociation. And this is the line that is so difficult for us, how to be completely relaxed, without being vague, without being spacey, without being dissociative, being very actively, alertly relaxed, you know? And I know that's not what you mean by dissolve. I, don't, I know you don't mean dissociative, but just in case anyone is going down the wrong road, <laughs> do not do it. 
yeah, <clears throat> it's it's the flow state, you know, it's that flow state in, in a lot of ways. So just remember that focus is usually associated with stress. It doesn't have to be. Relaxation is usually associated with sleep. It doesn't have to be. Focus and relaxation can come together. Yeah. Yeah, other, other thoughts? The meditation audio was not great this morning, is that right? Right. Right, Did, were you able to catch the main points um, or not? The idea about uh, looking at projection and things. Or it, it was completely lost. Did you hear what you said? No. No, no she didn't. You have to come. Please. Yeah, somehow the audio isn't as good today as it was yesterday. I blame gremlins. It's not yeah. that important, but we had the bad conditions this morning. It was very hot and the sound was very low. And it felt like a very important uh, meditation. And we were gonna be very deep thankful to have it again. I don't know what the program for uh, tomorrow or something, but now Airco is on and maybe it was important and we couldn't get through. I, I could mm. uh, believe some other people suffered as well, missing. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, uh, Karina and I have a plan um and hopefully we'll fix it but sometimes you know with this uh retreat environment it's like it invites obstacles which are part of the retreat which then become the learning of the retreat and it's happened so many times it's almost like there's a wave of such virtue that it pushes all the obstacles right to the forefront and then we have to clear them so it's not always a bad thing when there's obstacles but i'm glad that you told me um, the, the pith really of that meditation is that if we can acknowledge our own projections, it's much easier to take responsibility for our own projections and then release our own projections. You know, just like that, that story or that example we talk about so many times of, you know, if you're walking down a path at twilight and you see a coiled rope, but because of the twilight, it looks like a snake you'll be just as afraid of the rope as if it were actually a snake. But then, you know, take the analogy a few steps further. If you realize it's a rope and you were scared for no reason, you can laugh at yourself. And you can blame your eyesight or you can blame the twilight or you can blame whoever left the rope out. But the most useful is to just laugh at yourself because you've seen your own mistaken projection. And it's taking that kind of idea into the equanimity conversation, where you notice how agitated you make your own mind because of what labels you project on people. And in acknowledging that, you take the power back and give the power back to yourself so that you don't agitate your mind needlessly. But um, I'll send you another version of that meditation with better audio, hopefully, and uh, we can try it again. And uh, after the retreat, I can send you all of the audio ones in case you're curious to do them again. All right, um, other thoughts? Yep, just a minute. Ishai. Hi. <laughs> uh, if you please can uh, elaborate it more the differentiation between uh, uh, emptiness and uh, the lack of inherent existence, uh, attachment, and anger. If you take the, the snake uh, example, is there a situation when can I see, see a snake without attachment, I see inherent snake without attach, attachment and without anger? I heard some that the Buddha said that if there were that the, the inherent existence is not a problem. The attachment that comes with it and the anger is the problem. So can you elaborate about it? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's a little bit like the distinction between the fact that we have mistaken appearances and the way we believe them. You know, there's having the appearance and then there's believing the appearance. Believing the appearance is much more problematic in our daily life than the fact of having it. You know, so then in this case, we use the example of, you know, like you see your face in the mirror, you don't think there's a whole other face there. You know, it's a reflection. You don't think, oh, someone's in my house and freak out. So having the reflection is, or having the appearance isn't a problem because you know what it is. If you were to believe there was another person in the mirror, you would have all these afflictions and fear or attachment or whatever it is. So if in our daily life, we can practice challenging our belief in appearances, appearances are gonna be with us for a long time. So we need to change our relationship with them. It's only after we've realized emptiness directly that we won't have the appearance of inherent existence in meditation. But out of meditation, we still will. It just won't convince us as thoroughly as it does now. It's only a Buddha that doesn't fall into the trap of believing the appearances at the same time as seeing emptiness. Ultimate truth and relative truth appearing simultaneously is only the realm of the Buddha. So what we're trying to do is to say, all negative states of mind exaggerate. Attachment exaggerates the good and thinks that the good comes from its own side. Anger exaggerates the bad and thinks the bad comes from its own side. Because of attachment, we want more because we think it gives us happiness. When we have anger, we want to harm because we think it's hurting us. So these are exaggerations, but still a snake will bite you and still it's not good for your body, right? But there's a way to know that without believing the appearance of the whole story about it. And you see this in ordinary examples, you know, if you've seen documentaries, you know, David Attenborough or National Geographic or some documentary on TV, and you see someone who is very comfortable with poisonous animals because they've come to understand the body language of the dangerous animal. So they're able to be aware of the danger while not projecting anger and attachment, or at least as much. And because of that, there's a calm and there's a clarity, and there might even be a joy. And, and so what we can do is try and be in that place of a very skilled animal tamer or animal trainer who understands the danger of things, the negative potential of things, but also isn't blaming the object of the harm for it. Because we realize to be harmed is something to do with us, for them to want to harm is something to do with them. And the karma meeting of these two things is something very complex. To place blame anywhere is an exaggeration. And still caution can exist, but it's caution without anxiety. You know, like the way that you can be careful with things that you're good at and not be stressed. You know, like driving a dangerous country road the first time you might have anxiety. The 20th time, it's still dangerous and you're still careful, but you don't have the anxiety because now you're used to it. So you've kind of like settled the negative states of mind by understanding more of the picture. But I don't know, is that answering your question or were you looking at a different angle? Yes. Yes. It's just stay on these uh, you can do projections without anger and attachment. Mm -hmm. It's a natural, natural projection. From yeah. Inherent, seeing very inherent existence without uh, the afflictions. I understand if you want to, get, to, to go to Buddhahood, you have to, uh, to get the emptiness, but. Uh, Look, I mean, even an intellectual understanding, not even a realization, right? Just a very basic, not even perfect intellectual understanding of emptiness helps you question your appearances. And that it just gives you a few more moments of pause before reacting. 
And that changes your whole life. You know, imagine what a realization will do if just kind of having an idea about this thing makes you go, maybe that person I don't like and, and uncomfortable around doesn't exist in the way they appear to me. Maybe there's more to the story. That very simple idea has such transformative power if you can remember it, doesn't it? And it's not that hard. It just have to remember it on purpose, you know? And so that's what meditation is really, is remembering on purpose. Just to want to add, it is much more easier to see somebody else riding the, excuse me? Wild horse. Wild horse. Then when you are riding a wild horse, when you see him, you can see his projection, but when you were riding your, your wild horse, you don't see all projections. Now, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What else is coming into your mind? Or coming out of your mind? Which direction? Doesn't matter. Hey, Smadar. Uh, it's a follow-up question to uh, what you talked with Ishai <laughs> about the pure object that you talked with Ranan and what Ishai was talking about. What is a pure object? Does it need a mind to see its pureness? Does it say uh, that the, the Tagata heart is the pure object of the object? Is the pure object the Buddha's mind? What does it mean, a pure object? It's so uh, uh, difficult to understand. Does it need a mind to see it as pure? Yeah, it's, it's whose mind is seeing it, really. In emptiness, everything is pure, you could say. But that requires a lot of unpacking. <laughs> you know, everything is pure under the influence of realizing emptiness or nothing is pure or impure in and of itself under the influence of realizing emptiness. These words can be a little bit problematic because they sound like moralistic, you know, like good and bad or, you know, clean or unclean or something. They can have some religious connotation that is not intended. What, what is really is who, is who is looking at it. Whatever it is who is looking at it, there is a pure and an impure appearance depending on who is looking at it so there can be a monkey mind and uh, an empty mind at the moment looking at it and the monkey mind will have a pure quality well let's take it the other direction so say something we would consider pure say the buddha was in front of you shakyamuni buddha or prajnaparamita she's in front of you perfectly enlightened, all qualities complete. But because we have so much negative karma, we might see, you know, an old diseased cat with one eye. <laughs> and it would still take incredible merit to be able to even see that cat. Some people might not even notice the cat, right? So, you know, I'm sure around Neva Shalom, you can find one like this, right? So of all of the cats of Neva Shalom, you know, some of them are missing eyes, probably, I think of one or two. One might be a Buddha, one might be a real cat. Who is to say which is which? Because from our perspective, we're, our projections are all contaminated. So everything appears impure to us. But that's not to say the things themselves are impure from that perspective, it's just their appearance. The other side is that everything is empty of inherent existence and so has like essential purity. So there's kind of two ways to look at it. Sometimes we say the mind is pure because it's not able to be fundamentally contaminated by the afflictions. Sometimes you hear that framing as well. Yeah. 
zweite Ansatz ist ein Brechen der Tür des Verhans. Das ist auf der Mittelseite der The Buddha could hear it as pure mantra. It's good to be perfect for answering in the spot and preparing for it. Uh, one part of it was the question is idealization is always compensation for previous uh, failures of memory. So that's something that we have uh, discussed just uh, recently on the <coughs> On, on the first part, on the first pages of the definition uh, of corpus, uh, that was the way the thought uh, put it uh, before us. Uh, the channel of idealization might be a compensation for failure in the mirror uh, self object functioning. But uh, recently we have found in uh, the analysis of the self uh, some very, very crucial. Sentences which uh, attest to something different and thought uh, think, I think, on a much more metaphysical uh, layer of thinking is that any mere self object need is already a result of a failure in idealization. So it's the other way around. That not uh, the, the mirroring is the, the first one, and the compensation is the idealizing, but the, the other way. Uh, so I think that we, we will be able to find both both uh, manifestations of it on on a phenomenological and clinical uh, perspective or clinical dimension. But matter theoretically, I think that we would like to. Uh, agree to the second uh, stage of uh, thought uh, thinking, uh, which is not so secondly in a chronological perspective, but it was uh, phrased uh, in the first uh, documented uh, writing of him. So I think that this is the question of uh, more phenomenological and more deeper layer of the of the self-object uh, metrics. Uh, other part is uh, an attempt to, to take some inspiration from the Dharma teaching uh, of this retreat, so meanwhile, concerning uh, the question of the relationship between the grandiosity and the idealization. The idealized part of the self and the grandiose self. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the question is that an attempt to see again what's can, can we can we uh, do some linearity between the two sides of the self uh, as if we can uh, bypass or have some shortcut. Uh, directly to idealization without passing the uh, grant yourself. So, again, I think that as we are not enlightened, uh, we have only our ego, we have only our grandiosity, our uh, egocentric uh, self, uh, in order to practice transformation. That's well, that's a space, that's a, that's a dimension where we can uh, transform our mind and to get into the class of idealization, the class of information. 
I don't think it's a question of shortcut cutting or bypassing. I think that whenever a person can make uh, such a quantum leap into, uh, into idealization, it's a, a possible way. It's a possible uh, thing that we can see in our in our mind when we are treating and in, in, in uh, our patient's mind. So I don't think it's a question of uh, priority or uh, linearity, but we should see see when uh, the the ego is is a platform where we where we can uh, try to transform into idealization. Other part of the question was uh, an attempt to use the poetic metaphors of uh, Gorge concerning the primordial model. Uh, and I think that at least uh, metaphorically, we can say that the primordial model is the idealized uh, platform of the, of the mind. Where the father, where the masculine aspect is the emergence, uh, emergent uh, uh, facet of, of reality. Uh, just to say uh, about the words uh, that Newton uh, commented earlier, about the words dissolving and emergence that we are using, uh, just to remind you that the word emergence in the Dharma uh, vocabulary is. Uh, the world that denotes getting out of some sorry uh, of, of conventional reality. And it's, uh, it's used in, uh, in an opposite way that we are using it. So we are using it up to the quantum physicists uh, that, uh, according to them, the emergence is the kind of uh, change from superposition to a complete condition. That's uh, this process is defined as emergence, and we are taking this from, uh, from this vocabulary. Just to uh, let you inform you about this, uh, whenever you, you will uh, find the word emergence in the Dharma and, uh, vocabulary, it's uh, the known something which is different. It's kind of uh, the liberation from the samsaric and the conventional. Uh, facet of reality. Anybody wants to pose to Newton another thing? No, no, it doesn't matter. You can ask her, but from here, so Newton can hear you. It's about the concept of the About the question, asking uh, you and the Ranan, uh, how you define the, the merely labeled self or I analytically. Also, you think if you can say some words about the merely label, because you say all the time the. the, the you mentioned they are merely labeled. Shout. You said oh, the mirror label is a thing, let's say, between nihilism and reification. Sharp laser, sharp uh, razor, razor. Razor, razor. So I want to can also to uh, how do you define the mirror label self or I? Let's let's say Linton, please. <laughs> uh, is the sound okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> disembodied hand. <laughs> um, the razor's edge. It's it really is a razor's edge, and it the merely labeled I is the only self that does exist, and it only exists conventionally. So it's much easier to say what it isn't than what it is. It's not like the self is a label that cleanly. 
it's that the self exists in name only. Can you sort of feel it? It's like the self is not a name, but the self exists in name only. And anything more than its name attributed onto the valid basis is too much, is not the self. So, you know, then it's like all sorts of interesting questions arise, you know, like what is, you know, what is the body keeping the body together? What is keeping the mind together? What keeps the aggregates together and not disassembling or like, you know, going rogue or something? But, you know, to remember that anything that you're labeling onto also has parts which it's labeled onto. So you say the self is labeled on the five aggregates. But it's not like the five aggregates are only five, because each of the five aggregates is labeled on their aggregates, whether it's just moments in time or it's this their association with other things. But it's like it becomes almost infinite in terms of pieces, which means it's like it's dissolving not into nothingness, but dissolving into everythingness. And so you can slap a label here and say, we'll call this section of the mess Ishai. And it seems like a nice section, but you know, really where, <laughs> Ishai, where, where Ishai stops and you know, Mickey begins is far more abstract, you know, even in terms of atoms and temperature and energy, even though visually there is a distinction between the two bodies. In reality, you know, if we were to look at quantum physics or something like deep neuroscience, we would see that the connection between the two is very, very close. So, like that? I don't know. Better, worse, more words. Mm -hmm. So, Ranan, what is the self in psychoanalysis? Search for the self. I'm reading quotes sometimes, but what is the self in psychoanalysis? Mm -hmm. What you answered uh, just now to the child that the self is the uh, newly labeled self is the only self that exists and it exists only in conventional uh, reality. That's what we are doing in psychoanalysis. We are probing the conventional self existing in conventional reality. And we have to do it very, very thoroughly, very, very profoundly in order to explain it. What is a healthy self? The healthy self is a self that can transform, the self that can uh, realize uh, its ethical sense in the world, the message side of existence, and the self that can really reach the horizon of, uh, of emptiness, is conceptually is intellectually, and I'm sure that most of us, if not all of us, do experience it sometimes. Your feet? <laughs> Question. I just want to share a story that uh, in my room when I got there, I found a gigantic spider, like huge, which I never saw anywhere before. <laughs> and my first reaction was to look it in uh, Google to see if it's uh, poisonous and if I had to worry about it, I couldn't find. But then I, I said, okay, well, I'll live with it. And uh, he's up there and I'm here. He's not moving so much and I'm looking at it. It's actually pretty beautiful. And uh, in, in one day, uh, in the morning, uh, they came to fix something in my electricity that went wrong. So I, I was afraid that he would see the spider and kill it. So I, I didn't show him the spider and anything. 
So I'm living with a gigantic spider in my room now. Don't know if it's uh, lethal or not, but I, I'm, I have the belief that it's, it's going to be. <laughs> You, you respect each other's boundaries, it will be fine. <laughs> yeah, I like this. But it, it is interesting how uh, fear or absence of fear changes the relationship immediately, whether or not the, the thing or the person is dangerous or not. It might have dangerous potentiality, but it immediately decreases under the influence of who it's with as well. Yeah, I got, I, I got was the association was because we spoke of the snake that we immediately fear of and usually we fear of spiders as well especially if they're huge in Tel Aviv I never saw we have spiders but they're really small <laughs> so it's, it's something I'll show a picture of it later if you, if you, if you want to see but it's, it's huge Neve Shalom is an oasis for many things yeah yeah <laughs> I, uh, it's interesting because, uh, you know, my first semester with you guys, we were all together at Neva Shalom. It was so nice, you know, down at the spiritual center while the building was being renovated. And uh, my very first week, there were giant scorpions in my apartment, and I've never seen them again. All, you know, all the years after, I never saw them. And Raida, my landlord, was so embarrassed. She was like, oh no, oh no, there's never scorpions. What do you mean there's scorpions? And I was kind of like, cool, scorpions, because I'm secretly a child and I love them. And uh, I told a friend of mine who is very new agey, and she said, oh, very auspicious to have a scorpion because you are a Scorpio. This is very auspicious, <laughs> you know? And then I told my mother and she was like, oh my God, you're gonna die, get it out, you know? So it's like, the same little creature, a million different opinions, but what it actually is, we don't know, but we know that it will be better if we meet it with kindness. That's all we can be sure of. <laughs> Whatever it is, it will be better if we meet it with kindness, you know, and it, it is easier in these simple moments with simpler seeming creatures. And then we just take that knowing that we already have and expand to the humans. <laughs> It will be better if we bring more kindness. It will protect us, it will protect them. Oh. Okay, um, one more question or finished? Finish now. There's other questions for tomorrow. Okay. So invited all of you invited to write down your questions and phrase them in your mind for tomorrow. Okay, so now we'll do some meditation. And <clears throat> I thought for this after uh, question and answer session that it would be nice if our meditation was just plain shamatha. Um, <laughs> And so for your object, I think choose the object of your choice for this shamatha meditation. Um, useful to start with the breath to let surface distractions settle. But if you want to then shift to a mental image or shift to the mind itself, totally up to you. So we'll do a, um, a spacious group shamatha practice, but you can choose which object is your favorite. <clears throat> Okay, back to posture. Regrounding. Settling back into your space. and relaxing through the body, any tension that might have gathered. And come back to your motivation. 
all sentient beings who although self and all appearances are dharma datu by nature have not realized it thus i shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness i shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in well in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. and shift to single pointedness on the object of your choice.
catching yourself when you drift, returning to your chosen object decisively, on purpose.
nudge yourself back into focus whenever needed. And then just very silently to yourself, 
dedicate the energy of this focus and question and answer session. May we develop our potential to its fullest extent. May we remember the lack of inherently existent agent, action, and object. Okay, so just for the next few minutes, um, we'll do personal practice. So if you want to use this time to write any questions for tomorrow, or if you would rather continue to meditate or do some reading, everyone just stay in the gompa and uh, we'll do personal practice together.
and start to wrap up the thought that you're having or the question. Okay, have a nice dinner. See you after.